In episode 156 of the Guitar Music Theory podcast, I'm joined by keyboardist Scott Sheriff for another installment of How Does This Song Work? featuring Biggest Part of Me by Ambrosia. Greetings, guitar engineers. Welcome to the Guitar Music Theory podcast. If you're captivated by the magic of guitar music and eager to unravel the mysteries of music theory, you're in the right place. I'm Desi Serna, your host, fellow guitar enthusiast, and author of Fretboard Theory, Guitar Theory for Dummies, Guitar Picking Mechanics, and more. In each episode of this podcast, I delve into the fascinating world of guitar and music theory, demystifying complex concepts and providing practical insights to help you become a more informed and skilled guitarist. Together, we'll explore chord progression, scales, improvisation techniques, and more, unlocking the secrets that make guitar music an irresistible art. Today, in episode 156, I welcome back keyboardist Scott Sheriff for another installment of How Does This Song Work, featuring Biggest Part of Me by Ambrosia. Scott is the keyboard player for Carrie Underwood and also plays together with me in the Huey Lewis tribute band, The Heart of Rock and Roll. Scott plays in a variety of tribute bands in the Nashville area when he's not on the road, including an act called Yachts Landing that covers yacht rock classics such as the song we're going to examine today. It's going to be a great discussion, but before we get started, what do you specifically need to be working on right now in order to become a better guitarist? Go to my website, guitarmusictheory.com. Answer the question I ask you about your playing, and I'll send you free custom video instruction that is calibrated to your current level. Whether you're a beginner still needing to learn the basics, or you need help with bar chords, finger picking, lead guitar, worship music, or you want to delve deeply into music theory, I have a free course for you. I can put you on a plan to fill gaps in your knowledge so you can become a better player, move forward, and reach your music goals. So enroll in your free video course now at guitarmusictheory.com. You can click on the link in the podcast show notes. All right, we are ready to dive in. Welcome back to the Guitar Music Theory Podcast. Scott Sheriff. It is so great to be back here, and I'm super pumped to chop up this Yacht Rock classic. I love this song. I had this 45 growing up, and let's dig in and figure this thing out. Yeah, so I'm a huge fan of this song, Biggest Part of Me by Ambrosia, in part because my grandmother's name was Ambrosia, and how beautiful as that but also i just think this is like one of the greatest songs ever recorded um and it's keyboard heavy it's keyboard dominant although there's some nice guitar in there some of that popcorn picking as i call it and uh uh, there's even a little guitar solo and it's just super kind of uh uh, mellow and la- laid back and understated. I just love those uh, licks in there. Uh, the guitar is pretty simple. It's using some pentatonic, but the keyboard parts are quite complex with um, the layers of keyboards. You're going to talk about that. and But also just the harmony here and the chords and the structure. And th- um, this is probably one of the most complicated songs that I would have ever broken down in my How Does This Guitar uh, how does the song work series, which is why I needed you here. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> I'm happy to oblige. Yeah. Um, and uh, so you know this song well because you've performed this song. And also, I want to plug that on Apple Music and Spotify, uh, you have – tell us about this uh, mu- these tracks that you just released. So I've uh, – I'm on my second volume of karaoke tracks for Yacht Rock fans, um, and it's Yacht's Landing. Uh, I believe it's called like Supreme Karaoke uh, or Supreme Yacht Karaoke. I mean, you've got the listing there. But, 70 and 80s smooth grooves. Well, that's our yeah, that's Yacht's our logo. Landing. You think the uh, the artist is Yacht's Landing? 
or is the uh, artist the One Man Yacht Club? I can't. I, I should be more well versed on. There it is. The One yeah. Man Yacht Club is the artist, and the the two records I think are Supreme Car- Yacht Rock, Supreme Karaoke, or something like that. I'm looking at uh, Spotify right there. So I'm yeah, gonna... you can search One Man Yacht Club, biggest part of me, and you can find the track that. Uh, let's just give him a little sample of it, shall we? Let me start from. I'll start from the beginning. So you put this all together here. You've got a you've got a whole bunch of yacht rock classics: uh, "Baby Come Back," "After the Love Is Gone," "Brandy," "Dirty Work," "Georgie Porgy," and more. So people definitely want to check these out. You did this all on your keyboard, is that correct? Uh, yes. Most of these were done all in the box, including the fake guitar, fake saxophones. Uh, these are songs that I also perform in a solo gig that I play in various restaurants. Uh, mostly on the west side of town but I figured I made all these tracks I might as well add keyboards to them and release them as karaoke tracks because they had everything else finished so I went ahead and, and just use drum machines and stuff or just yeah, just, those? just samples and I programmed the drum parts and yeah. use uh, plugins for the bass and guitar and all the keys stuff obviously yeah it's really well done I actually listened Scott to this entire album when I was exercising at the rec center uh, wow. walking the track there and uh, I really admired like how well uh, all of this is done I know a lot of attention to detail was needed and these songs are not easy as we're going to get into this one today there's just there's a lot of complexity with the uh, harmony and everything like that so yeah so, so great the, job the artist is one man yacht club and it's the yachts landing supreme karaoke volume one and two for you yacht rock fans out there you can get it on apple music spotify and i've been told it's on deezer i'm not sure what deezer is but maybe that's a uh, international way to stream but it's out there through distro kid they just spread it out to all the different formats. So. That's awesome. That's great. So we're talking about this Yacht Rock Classic. We talked a little bit about that term Yacht Rock uh, the last time you were on the podcast, but maybe before we uh, get into the details of this song, let's refresh people's memories. So where did why do we use the term Yacht Rock? Where did it come from? Well, there were four uh, comedians out in on the West Coast in L.A. who loved this music, and uh, they kind of coined the term between themselves, and they started releasing videos uh, about how possibly some of these songs were written, and it's all tongue-in-cheek, extremely tongue-in-cheek, and also not safe for work, so I wouldn't watch the videos around your kids, but um, they are pretty funny, and they each play roles, like one guy plays Kenny Loggins, another guy plays Michael McDonald, and they have different other characters come in like Hall and Oates and Steely Dan and the Doobie Brothers and different producers and Michael Jackson, James Ingram. They all kind of come in and out of different episodes. I think they released over 10, maybe 12, 15 different Yacht Rock episodes, and they're each based on a, a song that came out the... The general era is 75 through about 82 or 83, and that was kind of the sweet spot for all the L.A. session heroes uh, when it was just a huge business out there. And the the music is kind of infused with a little jazz, a little R&B, but it was still – and it kind of airs on the the soft rock side of pop music, but it's all – complex and they 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 call it the doobie bounce and that's describing a keyboard part inside these songs a lot of them have electric pianos you know real they call it uh uh shimmery eps you know real bell-like timbres weave throughout this song generally had a very melodic guitar solo not a lot of power chords but just uh, that's kind of describes the yacht rock sound. It's it's I call it the Publix playlist because whenever I'm grocery shopping, <laughs> I'm being bombarded with yacht rock on the on the playback system there. So they coined this term yacht rock, and of course it conjures up these these images of these y- y- these people sipping these, cocktails and yes. stuff on a yacht and listening to this kind of it's like smooth jazz meets pop music and. Uh, yeah, yep. so I love it, and um, I'm a big fan of music from that era, and I love songs like Biggest Part of Me and others just because um, 
I just appreciate the musicianship and just the harmonic structure and everything. And the, they're just such well-written songs. And I don't know, you know, in recent years where I saw that there were these playlists on Apple Music and Spotify called Yacht Rock. And I was like, oh, I never heard of Yacht Rock, but I love these songs. Right. And I guess they are great songs to listen to while you're out on a boat. So Yeah, so different people. It's kind of an interesting subculture because different people have adapted that term. Uh, Sirius has a whole Yacht Rock channel. And so, you know, and there's a constant tug be- and disagreements between the guys who coined the term because they actually have a podcast where they listen to songs and they rate them on a scale from 1 to 100. And if the song is greater than 50 on what they call the Yatsky scale, they've named this imaginary scale after this guy who doesn't exist named Gene Yatsky, I think. And so they give every song a grade, and it's either pass, fail. If it's over 50, it's Yacht Rock. And if it's under 50, it's Nyat with an N at the beginning (laughs) of it. And there's constant... There's constant fighting online. If you go to the Facebook Yacht Rock pages, people throw songs in there like, hey, is Brandy Yacht Rock? And some people say, well, yeah, it's about a sailor. Well, Yacht Rock's not really about sailing per se. It's about a style of music. And so Looking Glass, although it's a great song, it's a great band, the guys who coined the term would probably say that Brandy is not a Yacht Rock song. And others, but, but Brandy did make it, it onto did. your one man yacht club. Band, I uh, I am yacht and yacht adjacent here. on my on my karaoke tracks because I just play with the people love in the club, and so you know I also I'm I'm not as much of a purist as they are either, but I definitely understand their their love for it and their need to create boundaries and say what is yacht and what is nyat. But, <laughs> you know, we just play from that era and what the stuff that people love. People will argue Hall & Oates isn't yacht rock either, but I love Hall & Oates, so I stick it in my playlist as well. Are the Bee Gees yacht rock? I think the Bee Gees have some songs that definitely made it on the Yachtsky scale. Probably... Uh, how Deep Is Your Love probably made it. And uh, they have a song called Love You Inside Out, which is my absolute top BG song. And that song is pretty yachty, I think. Yeah. It's got some great clav and some... Well, Jive Talking made it onto your uh, yep. Yachts Landing uh, album here, too. Yeah, so. the people dig that. And we usually... We have a band called Yachts Landing. That's why I took the brand and made it the name of these karaoke tracks. Oh, gosh, we need to plug that as well. And, of course, I saw, I, we had a double build together when we were playing with the Huey Lewis uh, tribute, and so I got to hear Yachts Landing, and it sounded fantastic. And uh, is there a website for that? Yep, it's uh, yachtslanding.com. We'll get you to the Yachts Landing page. ClassicTributeBands.com will get you to the also to the main page where all our tribute bands are featured. Uh, Yachts Landing is playing April 6th in Columbia, Tennessee, for their mule day celebration we're playing at the mule house and so that's going to be a fun saturday night show down there we haven't played down there yet so i'm excited to give some yacht rock to the columbia folks in southern williamson county is that the show that you asked if i'd be interested in subbing for and i i had to bail i said it's too hard i can't learn all (laughs) these complicated songs with jazz chords in it by then i had too much on my plate i'm like i'm worried about (laughs) getting that down but i would love to do that sometime in the future it still could happen yeah it still could happen maybe it'd be a, a better time well today we're talking about biggest part of me by ambrosia and i'm on wikipedia here and it says biggest part of me is a song by american band ambrosia from the album 180 released as a single in 1980 Um, the song reached the song reached number one on the countdown um, radio and records chart number three on both the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 and the Adult Contemporary charts. The song was written by band member David Pack. Pack re-recorded the song for his 2005 album, "The Secret of Moving On." Um, so David Pack is credited as being the lead vocals and the played the guitar on this. Um, and my first thought was, surely he did not write this song on guitar. So if you could give us a little bit of just the beginning of it on the keys, this is a, I mean, this is a song that's pure keyboard. This is not how a, key, a guitarist would think or play these particular voicings. You can play these. We're gonna, I'm going to do it here in a minute. But uh, let's give our listeners a little bit of what this sounds like from the top, if you don't mind. Okay, so on the top, uh, it's just Fender Rhodes, and they leave some of the passing chords out, so... 
the intro is just kind of a And on the repeat, like when the when the uh, vocals come in, could you do that again with some of those passing chords? Yeah. So then they add the acoustic piano to the layer once the uh, singing comes in <laughs> for a passing chord. <laughs> Another passing chord. Yeah, so it's sure. got a nice line cliche, what we called in at Berkeley. And then it starts over. So each chord has a part of the voicing that moves down by half step, which makes it super interesting. Well, let's uh, let's talk about that. Let's let's back up. We're going to talk about how this song works. So. What's our basic key here, Scott? B flat. B flat. Good horn player key. Yeah. Great Terrible guitar, guitar key. key. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually um, learned this in a half step lower in A. And I found some good videos online. For example, there's, there's a video on a channel called Dave's Guitar Channel. Wow. And it says, Lesson, Biggest Part of Me by Ambrosia. And um, Dave's got a lot of amps. Yeah, he does have a lot of amps in the background. And he did a good job of uh, uh, teaching you a way you could play this on guitar um, where you're making it, uh, pedals on the A, the, excuse me, the B flat, your tonic pitch there. Um, so it's easy to do this on guitar using the fifth string open. So. Oh, that is nice. Maybe he did write it on uh, guitar. Uh, um, and so then I can capo up now first fret. So instead of that fifth string open being A, it's B flat. And I move everything up uh, a half step. So I match the actual recording of uh, the key here. Whoops. Uh, uh, So we're in the key of B flat. So we want to think about the B flat major scale. Um, but this certainly goes outside of that. Um, so let's talk about these chord changes here. And we'll talk about what's happening on the keyboard. And we'll see if we can somehow make sense of this for your average guitar player. That would be me. You know, I'm a classic rock guy at heart and stuff. So I dabble in this sort of thing. But someone who maybe has... Uh, a um, a deeper background in jazz or something, this might not uh, be so unusual to them. But it certainly uh, is to me and probably will be for a lot of my listeners. So let's go through this. We've got B flat and a B flat major seven is kind of like our uh, primary chord here. But before that, I don't know if you're playing part of a, a C minor seven or a C minor... Or you could even think of it as an E flat. I play, yeah, I call it an E flat major seven over B flat. Well, that's right. You have a chart for this. Yeah. And you called it. Now, you called it E flat major seven. Oh, because you. Oh, do you have a D in there? Yeah. Okay. All right. I gotcha. also have an E flat in there, which gives it that rub in the middle. Okay. I don't know if you can do uh, well, that on a guitar, but uh, probably not. But I could do that. Yeah, I mean, as far as I almost liked it better the way you were playing it, but just on the keys. Yeah. You like having the E flat in there. And on the guitar, I do. But okay. Yeah. So you called it E flat major seven slash B flat because what you're doing on the keys, you're essentially playing an E flat major seven chord. You've got. The, and you've even got the, the E and the E flat in there? Yeah. Okay. Um, Especially because in the vocals, when they come in, they sing sunrise. That's one of the vocal parts. So it's 
that's that's kind of a more dominant note just in the overall harmony of the function of those chords in the song so to play it on that's why i like choosing the e flat over the d on the guitar for um, playing that i spoke incorrectly there i meant to say that you have the e flat but you also have its major 7th d yeah. that's what i meant to say but that's di that's diatonic yeah so nothing out of the ordinary um, you could think of E flat as the four chord to the one chord, E flat. You know, yeah. There's plain triads, just playing triads, the fancy versions of them, and just do the fancy versions, put the sevenths in there, right? And then from here, uh, oh, you're talking about the in between? Well, not the in between. Okay, not yet. Let's so just, we're just on the on the basic yeah. moves. Yeah, so the second move is a B flat six yeah. to a C minor seven over B flat. Oh, are you doing C minor seven? I just did a regular C minor. But I've heard some people call this, um, what would that be? A, f a flat major seven, but I don't think that's correct. A flat, ma yeah. Because you wouldn't put the A flat in there. It's more of a. It's really yeah. going, it's like part of, um, it's the two chord in the key. Yeah. But. Yep. With the B the, flat. The, it's all pedaling over the one. Pedaling over the one, yep. And also because it kind of gives the, the, with the chord that's coming next, it kind of has that four, four minor one, you know. It's, that's a very. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm hearing that. Okay, so if I were to break this down, though, into like its simplest form, I would think like the four chord to the one chord. This is still the one chord. This is like the two chord with the... Uh, and then the next one would be the four minor. And this is like the minor four chord, like the Beatles. Uh, exactly. So... I didn't do that right. Uh, ah, here it is. Back to the one chord, and then you have a two major. It's a little two-five progression. You, you know, that's with the bass notes, but it's all yep. over B flat. There's where it finally goes to the five chord. All right, so that makes sense to me. That's basically just two-five-one. Yeah. But it, it's a two major, so it's yeah. not quite the typical. If two it five. were diatonic, it would be two minor, C, like C minor, E major. I'm sorry, F I'm, major. I'm think I have the capo on here. Yes, uh, C seven. minor. Yeah, F F seven to B flat two five one. Yeah, uh, but it's very common to use a secondary dominant there, where you play that two chord as major. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then. So two five one, all right. So, I mean, really nothing too crazy there. We had that minor four chord, but you mentioned that there's a line cliche that these chord voicings that we're using, because we're not just using plain major or minor chords, are in part used because it there's some chromatic movement. So let's talk about that. Yeah, playing so the, the same changes. The inner voices. Yeah, um, so uh, we have a little bit of what my listeners would probably recognize as stairway to heaven type movement here, you know. Yeah. Right, um, but not in a minor key like that. Right. So, um, so we've got out of that two chord, C minor 7 as I'm playing it, uh, it's like... Or the four chord, you can think of it that way. That's how we talked about it earlier. We've got the B flat in there, and then uh, goes yeah, down that's to the, the major seven of a. B flat. Yeah. And then the passing chord is just a B flat thirteen with a flat nine. So oh, it's just that. That's all. <laughs> so just like a G chord in the right hand. 
So hang on for a second. Um, we didn't play that the first time. So it's not nice. in there the first time. Is that coming when the vocals come in? Yeah. So once he starts singing, uh, there's a couple extra chords added. Go ahead. Right here. Okay. And with those chords, we're completing that that descending yeah. chromatic thing. Yeah. So, so. And then like a... And then, uh, oh, are you putting, hold on, go through the chords again, so. Oh, you're hanging on that. Yeah. Okay. And then, going down a half step. Let's do it again. I'll play it on. The, I'm going to play the uh, chromatic line here. So three, four. Ah, sorry, Oops. I'm not playing it right. I'm dealing with a little latency here too. Three, four. Repeats twice. And you find the All right, from the top. Three, four. So it's interesting. But prior to that, before those little passing chords come in, as you call them, to kind of fill those chromatic spaces. Um, we don't have the full chromatic line. Right. It's just... Ba, 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 ba. It's almost there. It's all just missing one of the notes. So I wonder if, like, as the, he was writing this, maybe he was putting those changes together, and he realized that he had this line cliche, as you call it, um, with that descending part, and he thought, why not make it chromatic and let's fill in those spaces and... And so he put in those passing chords, which come in maybe perhaps part of his thinking process. We're assuming that uh, David Pack wrote this on keys. I can't imagine he wrote it on guitar. I mean, but who knows? when you were when you were in A, you know, it seemed a lot more plausible. But it, it certainly probably didn't write it in B flat on guitar unless he was capoed. But well, and I can't play the full voicings that you're playing, so I have to kind of. Pick and choose like which uh, you know which chord tones I'm able to to reach and finger. So. And there's also you know we have to kind of wonder if the session player you know added some arrangement ideas too. You know, say, hey, what if I threw this passing chord in there? Oh, who knows? That's a good point because um, on Wikipedia, um, David C. Lewis is credited as playing Fender Rhodes acoustic piano and. Uh, the Prophet Five, and then Christopher North, and you say that was a member of Ambrosia. I'm pretty sure, yes. Played the Hammond organ. So, she, yeah, maybe David C. Lewis came in there. Maybe he had more of a jazz background or something, and perhaps David Peck's, Pax, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> original chords, maybe they were simpler, and he was like, come on, let's add a little color here. Yeah, I mean, something. he's he's pretty brilliant musician. He's arranged for strings and done some really it was a pretty uh actually a pretty progressive band this their hits were more the the you know the exception to their repertoire than the rule as far as stylistically they were a much more progressive band than the public kind of perceives them to be if you really dig into the ambrosia catalog but yeah he's he's a pretty stellar musician i actually had him in my house in my studio Back in the early 90s, probably, um, I had an artist I was working with, and she was recording a song demo over at my house in Bellevue, and she was also a signed writer to Warner uh, Warner Chapel, and I believe maybe he was also a Warner Chapel writer. For whatever reason, she had met David Pack. He was in Nashville. She says, why don't we have David come play on this song? So she called him on the phone. He said yes. 
Next thing I know, he's in my house with his Korg A3 uh, guitar processor, and we're recording overdubs to this gal's song demo. And I uh, went to my record collection and broke out my 45, and he's like, wow, vinyl. And he grabbed a Sharpie and signed it, and that was my one experience with David Pack. Very pleasant. Did a great little, you know, nothing fancy, just kind of a, a picking, like you called a chicken picking overdub part to her song and it was a great addition and he was uh lovely to work with and just fun to hang out with that's a great story that's that's really cool and yeah you are right like if you listen to uh more of ambrosia's music you can tell that he was a very uh skilled and knowledgeable musician so and uh, who obviously had a background in r&b and jazz and rock and um all sorts of things and i think it comes through even in these um hit songs that you said were a little bit more uncharacteristic than their typical uh, uh, repertoire. But um, there's so many elements that come through. I think that's why I love this song so much. Yeah, yeah. and there, there, are two, uh, there are other two hits that are just fabulous as well, How Much I Feel and You're the Only Woman. Those are their three biggest songs, and they're just they're all very yachty, very sophisticated songs and great tracks, great performance tracks. He was also <laughs> friends with Leonard Bernstein, so he was... He has an interesting story. There's some podcasts out there with David Pack. He's a fascinating cat. And I think he's partially deaf, maybe even deaf in one ear, which makes it all even the more uh, amazing what he's been able to accomplish musically. Oh, he always was, you're saying. I don't know. I, I, don't, I can't speak for him. I don't know his history specifically, but I think that's part of the And story. isn't that true? Uh, we play in a Huey Lewis tribute band, The Heart of Rock and Roll. And I heard that Huey Lewis actually lost hearing in one of his ears back in the 80s, in the middle of the heyday of the band. He just had hearing in one ear. Yeah. And incidentally, Paul Stanley of Kiss um, was born with a condition where he only had like one ear and hearing mm. in one ear, which I think is amazing. I can't imagine like not having stereo hearing in two yeah. years. But anyway, um, let's go back to these changes here. So we talked about how it's in the key of B flat. Um, many of these chords can be seen as being like, you know, a four uh, to a one to a two, and then maybe that minor four chord. Um, we talked about it being connected with that um, cr descending chromatic, uh, what do you call it? A line, line, cliche. line cliche. But there's more going on there too, because we're not just playing, typically playing triads here. You know, we've got all these different chord tones and, and stuff. Any rhyme or reason to that in your mind? Do you, do you see why they added the particular chord tones they did? Um. Well, there's 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 the main line cliche in the bottom voices, but there's other ones along the way, like. That one kind of stays the same, but it's just. It just fits the at least fits your hands on it as a piano player. And it's almost kind of making majors into minors as you go down. That's kind of a dominant to this. You might hear normally this chord here but it's it studies over the b flat so it's just, it's just so much music theory interwoven and as to how these chords lead to each other so that's that's like a one feel we're sitting on home and then this next chord kind of wants to take you here and it does but it's all over b flat so that's like a uh, a one dominant it's leading it, to the four chord to a four yeah and yeah. then the next chord is just kind of like a four minor that takes you back to the one with a suspension you're suspending the four to the three and you're suspending the sharp five to the five and then you're into a basic two five to get back with different bass notes but as far as if you put in the theory Roman numerals over the top, you're sitting on the one, and then there's a one dominant chord that yeah. takes you to a four, and then yeah. there's a 
four minor that takes you back to the one, and then you have the two, and the five, the five, back to the one. But it's all jazzy chord substitutions and tensions and nines and thirteens and things like that. But at its at its root, that's kind of what's happening in the main Roman numeral thoughts and music theory behind the the song. All right, so I'm going to attempt to play this on guitar and go through those same changes. So. Ah. Let me try that again. So it can be done. Um, I have enough of the chord voicings in there. I'm not playing as many notes as you are uh, on the keys. Um, it's difficult on guitar. I mean, I'm using fingerings that are not standard fingerings, and it's um, it's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> Probably why he went with single notes. Yeah. So let's talk about the guitar. The guitar doesn't actually play through these changes. The guitar is doing this uh, thing here. Uh, actually, let's play it together. Ready? Uh, one, two, three, four. I'm kind of improvising here. It's based uh, loosely on what you hear. But I call this popcorn picking. I don't know if you ever heard that term or oh, not. Yeah. Oh, have you? Okay, so I'm, I heard some other guitar player talk about it. So it's I'm playing super some, muted, too. Yeah, you're muting it. And this is a technique where um, my fretting hand fingers are not holding the note. I'm pressing down when I pick the note, and then I release the pressure so that... The note isn't played. I can also palm mute with my right yeah. hand. That but seems can... like more the timbre that's least on the record. But yeah, because sometimes it's like you know, without any yeah. right hand right. palm muting. Right. If you got the right touch, yeah. you can do it. But some players would use their right uh, hand as well. So. Some combination, really, yeah, so yeah, more muted sounding, yeah, yeah, and he, depending on what players are uh, most comfortable with. And I'm thinking of this as being the B flat major pentatonic. So think my girl, <laughs> yeah, you know, or think. Uh, Van Morrison, uh, mm. Domino, you know, s simple stuff like that. I reference and teach some of those songs when I introduce, introduce the major yeah. pentatonic. Um, and so this is a great way to add another layer of instrumentation. The keys are so busy, and there's layers, right? Because we have mm. how many uh, keys, keyboard right parts now, on this? It starts with the Rhodes, and then they add acoustic piano when the singing starts, and then second verse hits, you've got B3 that comes in, too. Yeah. And then you've got synth pad that comes in for the bridge and strings, and so... Yeah, it gets rather key heavy. Yeah, so there's no sense in the guitar coming in going. No. Especially with the thick vocal pads spelling out the chords as well. Right, we have all parts. We have, yeah. Yeah, so um, the perfect guitar part is doing something simple like this. And it just kind of pokes in and out. It doesn't interfere with all that, that uh, really dense. Uh, those dense keyboard chords and, and that harmony. And it's just a really great uh, technique, and it just adds a groove and a feel to it as well. And I'm mainly kind of playing around that tonic pitch, B flat, with yep. its fifth and the sixth. So, And maybe I'll put in a little bend there. Yeah, throw a little blues and, in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Perhaps, yep. I think maybe in the solo, maybe something like that might come up. I'm not sure. Um, and I think I did hear a fourth in there. Like. 
maybe yeah. at times. And then later in that solo, we'll, we'll kind of get to that. I didn't work it out, but I, I heard it, and I can tell that it's basically just pentatonic stuff, you know. Maybe some of that blues, you know. B.B. King stuff. Yeah. I don't think it goes too... I don't think it does any minor stuff, actually. But it might do the major blues. Yeah, it's definitely got some blues. Does it? Yeah, and then okay. the sax comes in. Cool. Um... So uh, that's what the guitar does. He actually I mean, plays kind of like that rhythm part as part of as a, like the beginning of a solo. Singing, and then the sax takes over. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty simple, but it's but it's perfect. Yeah, and a lot of guitar players, if they learn this song really don't need to be concerned about all those chord changes. You know, I love this so much, I wanted to analyze it. <clears throat> and it's a great example of thing, things that I do teach in, uh, like, fretboard theory and guitar theory for dummies. I talk about that uh, chromatic half-step movement in songs like Stairway to Heaven, and I talk about secondary dominance and two five ones and that sort of thing. And I make reference to some songs that use it. They're usually simpler songs. They're not quite as complex as this, but... You know, you hear something like this can be kind of overwhelming, <clears throat> especially to us guitar players. And uh, while it is uh, more complicated, it is related to the things that we know. You know, it's it, it's in a key here. We've got some dominant function, two, five, one. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, a guitar player honestly doesn't have much to learn with this particular song. You learn the popcorn picking, you know. <laughs> And how to just kind of move through the pentatonic scale. And you can put together <laughs> yeah. most of your part. That's not always the case. I saw you play with Yachts Landing, your, lo your yacht rock uh, band. And uh, on guitar was... Jim Frazier. Jim night. Frazier, who did a great job. And there were many songs where he was required to do a lot of um, rhythm guitar parts where he had to play some, these uh, chords with more chord tones and extensions and all this stuff. Yeah. And of course, he's right on top of it, and he had appropriate sounds and everything, and he hit the leads when he needed to hit the leads. So uh, there's still a lot that the guitar uh, does in this genre of music. But on this song, we get lucky. We can learn a little bit of pentatonic and kind of uh, fill the space here. So that takes us through uh, the verse, but why don't we talk about as it transitions from the verse into the chorus, and we'll uh, let's do a little bit of the chorus. Okay, so when you finish the first verse, there's it goes into a. What, what do you, it's not really a verse chorus song. There's kind of an A B, A B C type song. Uh, well, I guess you could call this "Make a Wish, Baby" the chorus part, but uh, they don't even say the title in that section of the song. So I don't know. You yeah, can... it's interesting. I, I I remember thinking about this when I was listening to it with someone before that like they say the title at the end of the verse. Right. You're the biggest part of me. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so. not really the hook. The because the right. hook is make a wish. Right. That's kind of the you know you're at the the new section. But getting into that section is really simple the first time. It's just your basic one dominant seven. And with that's the nine in it. And so if you're playing the one chord as a dominant, that's going to want to push to the four chord. Yeah. Make a wish. There's the four chord. With major, major seven. seven. Maybe a nine, a nine two. So Make on guitar, wish, if I want to put the nine in there, I have to take the third out. So. Yeah, you can make it into a, a Steely Dan nine chord. Luckily, we on piano can play them both. And then you, it's a three minor seven to a six minor seven and that's so that makes sense to me on guitar i yeah. could use standard bar chords there four major seven three minor seven six minor seven and then they throw that one seven in there 
going back to the four the second time as a little passing hit. So in time. That, what take, that voicing drags are, you. Uh, that's a 13. Okay. So that's a dominant seventh with yeah. like a sixth in there. Right. We call it a 13 because it's And it's the nine piano. No, piano. Oh, you got the nine in there as well? Yeah, typically on piano when you're voicing a 13, you want the seven, the nine, oh, the right. ten, and the 13. Technically that's supposed to be in there. Yeah. But you want the what they call guide tones, the third and the seventh, which gives which gives it their gives it the flavor. Seven flavor and then add the nine. Um, nine and the how about You what? don't want the four in there. Four is bad. So I've got a root. Here's my flat seven, nine. Did you say there was an eleven there's, in there? There's no no that's that's gotta be a half step lower. Oh, okay. There it is. There's your thirteen. Now, we guitar players would typically... I know. That'll give you cramps right there. Look at that hand position. Play a uh, simpler version of this. Yeah, right there. there it is. So... Now, this is another two... Five, two. One with a suspension to another suspension on or the would you do it like this because you got some more I mean yeah I mean it's, it's I, I don't I don't think guitar has to play exactly the way piano players so what piano what I'm just doing I add the the five of the C chord before I suspend it just moving the four to the three and I'm adding a nine in there and a seven in there. And then the same thing for the five coming up. It's not a pure E flat over F. I play it as an E flat major seven over F because I'm gonna suspend the four to the three and play a full F 13. I play the same voicing in my right hand, which is the the B flat moving to the A, but it's still got the those three notes at the top of it: the thirteen, the seven, and the nine. And I'm just thinking of that as like a. <clears throat> I'm thinking that as an E flat major seven with F in the bass. Exactly. And then this is like note. F6, but I have the flat 7 in there as well, so that should technically be called F13. Yeah. F13. yeah. But if we break this down numbers-wise... So we got um, 4, 3, 6. 6. And repeats 4, 3, three six. 6. And that's all diatonic, by the yeah, way. Yeah, with these the and then, secondary well, dominance second thrown third, in there. Yeah. yeah. That one chord pushing back to the 4 chord. And then the last time, and then it goes to the two, six, and then two it's basically major. two five one with some fancy yes. coloring in back there. To the... But it's basically two five one. Yep. So it's four three six one four three six one four three six two two five. One. Yeah, it goes. It's a very yep. circle of fifth. Yeah, and if, when you play this on guitar, <clears throat> because we can't always um, get the bass notes in there and we're playing some fragments of chords and stuff like yeah. that, or certainly if you found tab to this song, I don't think there is any guitar tab to this song. I don't think you're going to find any tab that will show you the keyboard chords on guitar. But I know just from my past experience, you know, when I was trying to learn music and, you know, maybe it was a Steely Dan song or something, and I'm looking at the guitar tab if it was available and, there was these unfamiliar chord shapes. It took a while. It wasn't apparent 
for me to realize, oh, wait a minute, this is just two five one. Yeah. Because I was just playing some some maybe some inversions or fragments or pieces of those chords in an in unfamiliar using unfamiliar fingerings and stuff like that. And so um, as I learned more <clears throat> about music, I realized that I needed to try to, instead of just memorizing stuff um, or maybe even focusing on the chord tones, the 13s, that sort of thing, like I had to break it down to, wait a minute, like if I were going to play this with basic chords, what does this stem off of originally? You know, So this is four, three, six, four, One. Yeah, with the two major, yeah. Yeah, but then you go in there and add all that color with the major sevens and the minor sevens and <clears throat> the nines and the thirteens and all mm -hmm. of that. So hopefully my listeners um, can make sense of this you know, uh, and they're familiar with the number system. And so they can, even though some of this other stuff might be a little beyond them right now, you're at least, <clears throat> uh, if I speak to my listeners here, here's one reason why we learn the number system. Because if you're playing U2 songs that are one, five, six, four, you know, and other, you know, or Green Day songs or something like that, <clears throat> or you want to get into jazz someday or stuff like what we're doing here, Ambrosia, biggest part of me, it still is built off of that same system. You got to know your major scale and how you harmonize it to make chords how you get that sequence of, you know, major, minor, minor, major, major, minor, and so on. Um, or how you can go beyond the triad. Instead of just doing one, three, five, with each chord, you can do one, three, five, seven, one, three, five, seven, and get, you know, jazzier sounds. So um, it all, it's all built. It all stems from that same foundation, whether yep. you're playing U2 or you're playing uh, Ambrosia here. All right, so that covers the chorus. Um, I don't know if there's what the does the guitar do anything in the chorus or is it out? Um, we can check out the track. I don't see it in the chorus. <laughs> If we can listen to the, I don't, uh, might want to hit the other karaoke track and see if there's anything in the chorus. It's going to be about, uh, as far as the timestamp, um, it is about a 56 seconds or a little less. So this maybe, is your, 50 this seconds. is your track here that's up on Spotify. Yeah. I don't hear any guitar, so. Yeah, so you didn't. That put doesn't mean there. there's it's not in there, but I don't think I think I, I would mean, have I put it be. in there if there was. Especially not the first chorus. The first chorus is pretty sparse. The background vocals take up a lot of. Space. I hit the wrong button. I stopped our recording. I meant to stop uh, the track. So, yeah, I mean, I could pull up a copy of the original song. Let me do that really quick. I'll pause this recording again so we we would try to you uh, do it or I can do reduce it. the possibility of copyright uh, claims. All right, we just listened to the actual original recording, and we don't really hear any guitar in there. So... Um, but there's lots of vocals in there, isn't lots there? So of the guitar player is probably singing backup vocals here. I mean, if I was playing this in a band, it would kind of depend on how much is how many instrumentalists there were. Maybe it might be necessary for the guitar to kind of fill it out there. I would probably just do some sixteenth note strumming. Yeah, might you know, as well keep the chicken picking going on, popcorn picking. So I might do something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'd have to kind of feel it out. Or, or just I might more not... single note stuff, you know? Yeah, you know. Uh... Something like that. Yeah, you can just hang with the, even the kind of the original. Yeah, 
you're right. Don't overthink it. Don't even. Right. I was trying to follow the chord changes, but yeah, it may yeah. not be necessary. It's a diatonic tune, so you're you're good staying in that pentatonic world. Well, for the most part, it's a um, it's a song that does stay in one key, and that B flat is always the general key. That major scale is the general structure, but. Um, it's not diatonic in the sense probably that there the, are there's chromatic that's probably stuff your in there. Least, yeah, it's probably your one venture outside of the diatonic world is that two major. Yeah, but that doesn't really affect. Well, you'd probably be out at that point anyway on the guitar if I was yeah, doing you don't some want chicken to be picking. Hitting no Fs. And yeah, that's a bad note. Well, there's really only one other part to this song. Um, yeah, with and that would be the bridge. You want to give yeah. us a little bit of that? Mm-hmm. So it's interesting because the they the keyboard player kind of brought this that that move from the the end of the chorus. Wash away the past. We can start a new that keyboard thing. So it starts on a six minor. So we're on the six minor there, and that's just a that's an instrumental transition. Uh, that's not you know that's we're not in the bridge officially yet, but it's just kind of an inst an interlude to get us to the bridge. But then the chords are different in the bridge. So, well, hey, let's go through that instrumental. So we got the six, six minor. minor, and what are you going to after that? And then it's like a F seven, but it's got a suspension in it, and then resolve it. Kind of like we did in the in the chorus. So we can wash, so that we can start a new. Uh, you know how I went from the two major. Wash away the past, so that we can start a new. Oh, that shape. So it's like all right. So, so that's minor. the second. That that chord progression comes back in this transition in, as the second chord. So it's the sixth, then it's. Then it's a four major seven, four, and three minor, three minor. It's just kind of like another walk down line cliche. And then it goes back and forth from the four major, four major to the one major to the four major, and then oh, a little that push on the three. Yeah, it's it's on. The, in it's a bar forty six interlude two. So. Kind of like Steely Dan chordish. They're all major nine chords with a slap the six minor or slap the three minor seven at the very end. My guitar, I'd probably just do minor seven or major seven to minor seven. So. Then the vocals come in, and yeah, now we're in a kind of a four. It kind of rocks back and forth between four major seven and three minor seven. Then it goes to the six minor. Then we're back to the bridge progression or the interlude progression. And then this is also borrowed from the the interlude. So they grab that little section from four, the end of three, four, three. Yep. Yeah. So it's four. Four major seven. And we're back to the inner little, little six minor. go to a two major with a suspension and a big build up to get us to the solo and then the five seven with a suspension and we're into the solo awesome yeah so again they gotta know they, that number system and 
then it's a lot of added chord tones on top of those yeah, there are chords. The keyboard player on this session what really went back to that 5-7 sus with the 13 in it. Is that what I was doing here? Though? That a lot. More or less, yeah. yeah. If you had more strings, maybe. <laughs> but you, you're, covering as, you're covering it well. Soldiering through. So those are the main changes to the main part, and then we get into the solo. And it's I all over the verse. Yeah. I don't know the solo. I never, I didn't actually learn it, but I, I know that it's just pentatonic stuff. Yeah. And so, so I could improvise over that. Could you give me some of the progression there? And I'm just gonna kind of, uh, I'll kind of play you what I have on the karaoke track, whatever it's worth. Coming sure. In. So we got. Sex. Let me try that. Ready? Yeah. I'm gonna just j jam with you here. We'll play together. Two, three, four. So that walk up into the chorus is a little more is another line cliche. That sounded like a blues thing, kind of like a almost like almost. That. Yeah, whereas the first time we just kind of went to the regular B flat nine to get us into the bridge. This starts with a nine chord. So the little line cliche walks up from over the B flat. We have the third of the chord. Then the fourth of the chord, and then sharp four, and yeah. then to the five. So it so starts on a nine. Chord. I recognize that as a guitar player as being kind of like a kind of a bluesy thing. Oh, even though they're doing something a little bit different there. Yeah. So, so the second chord is just a straight A flat over B flat. Um, so. They take this four and sharp it, making it a uh, like a augmented. Aug on this, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they call it a sharp eleven because you have the the root, the nine, the sharp eleven. Then it goes back to the regular nine. Yeah, it gets okay. simple at the so. end again. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so. Three, four. Oh, it's, it's not good. It's, yeah, a couple of beats. Two beats so. each. Two, three. But it's all, it's leading from, it's all leading into creating a dominant push from the yeah. one chord into the four chord. So much right. of this song is focused on that We're four just chord. We're creating the tension and something interesting. Moving inner line. So good. Oh, yeah, stuff. it's so much better than just hanging on this five seven chord for two bars. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, we really can't have a lesson on this that's complete without talking about the vocals as well. Um, not only are there dense chords here and layers of keyboards and stuff, but there's tons of backup vocals. So. Maybe we can kind of go back to the top of the song. It's very interesting. The structure of this song is so unique because the backup vocals come in first, and there's this kind of uh, interplay between the lead vocal and the backups. So let's talk about that. And I know you've got that you um, are a singer. You sing in all the acts that you're part of, and you're also a guy that people often look to to help arrange uh, harmonies as well, vocal harmonies. And you... Um, sang all the harmonies on the track that you made. Is that right? Could we hear a little bit of that? Yeah. So, uh, and I preface this with when you're pulling stuff out of um, these old 
recordings, you know, I'm not going to say this is exactly what happened, but to the best of what my ears can hear out of the two mix. And what's interesting is I've, uh, as a side note, I've been doing helping bands with their background tracks, recording them for them when they go play live. Uh, and I was just recently working on some Tom Petty stuff. And there's some great recordings out there that are on YouTube, vocals only, so you can actually get a really great reference of what's going on behind all that music, whether it's the the algorithm and the technology they've used to pull the music out. I don't think these YouTube channels have access to the masters and are doing it themselves, but somehow they're able to pull everything out but the vocals and the background vocals. So all that to say, you might be able to check this against a recording that's out there, but what I have is this for the chorus. Sunrise in your eyes, realize. So that's the first half. The second half ends just a hair different. Stay the night, shine the light, all my life. It's got that moon. And the last chord, I don't hear that the first half through. So either it got by me or they just got a little tricky with it and said, we want to do something just slightly different the second time. And I think that's arranged out for three parts where you really probably could add a fourth part in there, and maybe they did. Um, but for my bands, it's it works best with just those three parts. So I had to kind of pick the notes that I favored in there uh, that – that stand out. Could most. we maybe hear them one at a time? Could we yeah. go back to the maybe just take that first line and let's hear each one of the parts there. Right. Sunrise, of course, that's the one everybody hears at the top. Eyes, realize. And so, and then there's the part underneath that. And are these doubled Sunrise, too? Yeah, they're just you're singing them twice. Yeah. And you're singing all these. Yes. Yeah. I should have uh, synchronized my S's, but, you know, this is was originally made just for live recording where a lot of those details just get lost in the bottom part. Sunrise this is kind of the in your eyes, line cliche part. Mm, yeah. So the second time through, uh, this middle part changes just a hair. Sorry. Rainbow. Nope, there it is. It's coming. Stay the night. Shine the light. It's going to stay on that note. Oh, my life. Whereas the first time, it went down. But it's. I definitely hear that note in it the second time, creating the add to kind of flavor to that one chord. Now, are those vocal parts, are those all notes that are coming right out of the underlying chords? Yeah, they're just kind of just following the the top part, kind of follows the top note of the keyboard voicing. voicing. As the, the bottom one, the bottom note just about follows my thumb in those. But then I play this. So there's it's um the vocal chords are just about mimic or definitely complement what the keyboard's doing with the right hand. All right. Well, you know what, Scott, I think we've covered so much here and I think people have a much better understanding of how this song uh works. So, thank you so much for joining me and coming back on the podcast and talking about such a great song and just showcasing your great knowledge and your skills and your 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 production skills uh and everything. So, why don't you tell people um remind them where they can get this uh track that you made? Yes, you can get it on all the uh, all the streaming services, the artist's name is One Man Yacht Club, and it's Supreme Karaoke, or Yachts Landing, Supreme Karaoke, Volume 1 and 2. Uh, we are working on Volume 3 as we speak, so uh, you can see me play in Nashville. Just follow me on Facebook. I'm always posting uh, where I'm playing uh, each month, 
whether it's a restaurant or with one of my various tribute bands. We have That's a Steely Dan tribute. Scott Sheriff, S H E R I. One R, two Fs. So it's basically facebook.com slash Scott Sheriff, and it goes to me. Um, so we have a Steely Dan tribute. We're celebrating our 20th anniversary this April 19th at 3rd and Lindsley in Nashville. Our Yachts Landing Yacht Rock Band is playing in Columbia, Tennessee, April 6th, and uh, so on and so forth. And with the Opry, with Carrie Underwood at the Opry on April 13th, my birthday. So busy April coming up, and I'm looking forward to it. That's awesome. Well, I was going to ask if you would sing and play us out, but you know what? I've decided I'm not going to do that. I want you to play the progression during the solo, and I want to jam a little bit here. All right. Well, we can Should do, we do both, that. But... So here we go. One, two, three, four. Podcast 156 is a wrap. If you have any questions about this song or you'd like to suggest songs for me to cover in future podcast episodes, just head over to my website, guitarmusictheory.com. You can scroll down and click on the contact link. And don't forget, while you're there, answer that question I ask you about your playing, and I'll send you free custom video instruction that's calibrated to your current level. Whether you're a beginner still needing to learn the basics or need help with bar chords, finger picking, lead guitar, worship music, or you just want to delve deeply into music theory, I have a free course for you. I can put you on a plan so that you can improve your playing, fill gaps in your knowledge, move forward, and reach your playing goals. So enroll in your free video course now at guitarmusictheory.com. You can click on the link in the podcast show notes. All right, guitar engineers, thanks for listening. I'm Desi Serna. Before you go, be sure to subscribe to this podcast, give it a five-star rating, and leave me a great review if you can. Then keep playing and stay tuned for more.